much, Imran, for the introduction. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Imran, for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, can you hear me properly? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. All right. So then let me start. And um, so um, the, 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 the topic for today, the, in fact, there are two related topics. One is a combinatorial question. Um, and the other is a algorithmic question. And as usual, you know, you start from the algorithmic question and you end up at a at a combinatorial question, which then you have to solve to be able to have a good algorithm. So uh, let me just um, uh, give you some basic sort of hard problems uh, on graphs. So the the probably one of the most fundamental ones is independent set. So you're given a graph, and your goal is to find a maximum subset of vertex, a, a subset of maximum size such that, um, you know, pairwise, there's no edge between your subset uh, from the graph. So here, for example, uh, you have, a, you see a graph and um, red ones are three vertices where there is no edge between them. Uh, can you find four here? Um, probably, uh, I didn't look that hard, but it's a tough question. Uh, and sort of, it's a very basic combinatorial question. So I give you a graph and I ask you, give me a subset of vertices of the largest size, which are pairwise, which have no edge among them. Uh, it's it's uh, inverse question is the clique problem. So I give you a graph and you want to compute a clique of largest size. Um, um, okay, and this question is algorithmic. So I'm, um, I mean, you could ask, what is the size of an independent set, which is a combinatorial question, uh, but of course it could be very small. So if you have a complete graph, on n vertices, so every pair of vertices are connected by an edge. Then you know the maximum independent set has size one, uh, and the clique has size n. Uh, you have the set cover problem, so you're given a bunch of elements and a bunch of sets. So the elements are these black dots here, and the sets are these uh, shapes. And you know all the points contained inside a shape that's a set. So you have like S one. Uh, which contains, uh, you know, uh, one, two, three, four, five, these six points. You have S2, which contains these four points. And then you have S4, which contains these five points and so on. And our goal, uh, you know, is either to find the smallest number of sets which cover all the points uh, or the, the sort of the dual hitting set problem where you want to find the smallest number of points which hit all the sets. Uh, and then a related problem is dominating set in a graph. So this is independent set is on a graph. This is on a set system. Um, or hypergraph, uh, and then this is on a graph where I give you a graph and I ask you to find me the smallest number. So here, in independent set, we are maximizing the independent set. We are minimizing the set cover. Uh, and here, we are also minimizing the dominating set. I want to pick, pick the smallest set of vertices so that every other vertex is connected to one of them. So unless I messed up, uh, what you see in red is a dominating set. Um, well, I guess I did mess up, right? Because this vertex here, no, this is fine. It's connected to this red one. Okay, so, you know, again, uh, easy to state, difficult to solve these questions. And uh, not just that they're difficult to solve, but they're also difficult to approximate. Um, and by that, I mean the following. So this is just a snapshot from Wikipedia. Um, so for example, the independent set problem here, or it's sort of clique. In the complement graph, uh, you have the set covering problem, you have the hitting set, and so on. And these are not just uh, sort of the initial NP complete problems, but they're also very hard to approximate. So, for example, for set cover, if you are restricted to polynomial time, uh, an opt is less than the size of the best possible, the smallest set cover, uh, then you cannot find in polynomial time a set cover of size uh, smaller than some log n times the optimal. So it's not that you can't get opt. So it's not that you don't have a polynomial time algorithm to get opt, but you can't even get, uh, you know, within two opt, three opt, four opt, five times the optimal size, a hundred times the optimal size, a million times the optimal size. In fact, none of that is possible in polynomial time. And it's pretty amazing that that you can, that, you know, people have been able to show that, that in polynomial time, in fact, if you want to approximate even the question, there is, um, it's, there's, there's very little hope. Unless, you know, P is equal to NP and those kind of things. All right. So for general graphs, these questions are hard. And so typically people look at special cases, which are still interesting from an applications perspective, but which have a lot more structure in them. 
And you know, probably the most studied case is that of planar graphs. So you are given a graph, which is planar. So planar means that you can draw them in the plane, the edges. So you put the, the vertices as points in the plane mm -hmm. and the edges between pairs of points you can draw as a curve uh, so that you know these curves are pairwise disjoint. Of course, they can you know sort of uh, meet at a vertex, uh, which is their endpoint. But otherwise, in the interior of these curves, uh, you know they don't intersect each other. Now, this graph is a planar graph, uh, and it has a lot of structure. And so the you know the early question in the seventies that people asked was um, if those you know uh, if for these particular cases one can do better. Uh, so for example, here is an independent set here of size four. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you can find an independent set here of size five. Um, okay, so this question is also NP hard. Uh, so unfortunately, you cannot solve this question uh, in polynomial time. You can't find the best answer. And when I say polynomial time, you know, I don't mean n n square. I, I mean n to the hundred, n to a thousand. Uh, it's you know, uh, it's just NP hard. Uh, but uh, it turns out in a really a, a fantastic result from the 70s by Lipton and Tarzan that this you can do, uh, you can approximate it fast. So it's not in the same category as general graphs. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, let's say O or opt is one, pick a, uh, pick one optimal answer. We don't know what it is, but you know, we keep it in mind. And now uh, the game is that someone gives you a parameter epsilon and you want to compute a solution uh, an independent set here. So that's my i. So that i is not too much smaller than the optimal answer. So remember, in independent set, we are maximizing. So we want a big set. Um, so we find we want to find a set i, which is independent. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a proper solution. But uh, And we know that you can't get optimal answer in polynomial time. That's NP hard. But if someone tells you how close you want, they want their answer, then uh, you want to take that into account to try to find something which satisfies that. Okay, so that's what we want. So when I someone gives you an epsilon, I want to compute an independent set of size, one epsilon fraction of the optimum. Now, here, as epsilon goes to zero, you get a better and better solution, right? As epsilon goes to zero, in the end, of course, if you set epsilon to zero, you get the optimal, which you can't do. But you could decide you want epsilon half. You want, you know, um, and the question is, can you uh, do that? So. In this kind of setup, epsilon is considered a constant, uh, and the the question is just that the the in n n is the variable, so n can grow very large. But epsilon in your mind, you think of it as a constant, which gives you a lot of freedom to do various things. So, for example, these algorithms are fine. I mean, they're not very efficient, but we would still call them polynomial in n uh, because, for example, this is much better, you know, uh, and this while quite bad, is still sort of polynomial because if you fix epsilon to be a constant, then this is just a, a polynomial. So it's not exponential. Um, okay, and within that, you know, people classify uh, these kinds. This is called the pitas, and there's this q-pitas, and there's linear time pitas, and so on, f-pitas, and so on. So there are various classifications here that, you know, we will not um, concern ourselves with in this talk, but, but this is a setup. So someone gives you a, a planar graph, someone gives you an epsilon. And your goal is, and this is your budget. You can, you know, n you should consider a variable, but then otherwise you're free to use as much time as possible uh, with epsilon. And so the the breakthrough paper of uh, uh, Lipton and Tarzan from the 70s showed that in fact it is possible. Uh, you can do that, and this is just uh, I copy pasted their uh, abstract and the, the, the sort of you know uh, uh, these are the keywords from the 70s uh, and. Uh, the, the, the two words which are really turned out to be very influential uh, is divide and conquer, which is a standard technique, but also separators. So let me then sort of uh, give a bit of overview of how they did it and uh, sort of where they got stuck. So you're given a planar graph, you know, it would be, uh, I didn't draw the planar graph. So imagine, you know, what you see, you know, are these vertices and on them we have a planar graph. And what they showed was that, um, Ah, yeah, yeah. Imran, uh, you have a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nabil, uh, uh, can you go to the previous slide? Yeah. Oops. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, for this particular graph, uh, can you give an example, particular example of this uh, O optimal function for given upsilon? Yeah. Uh, right, so op 
opt so you, you, someone gives you a planar graph and optima is the size of the largest or largest independent set so here in this planar graph you have to calculate what's the best answer and you there could be many best answers and you pick one best answer and that's mm -hmm. what's called uh, what the size of that is opt so here for example i picked an independent so the goal here the optimal answer is the largest subset of vertices which are independent and by that i mean the largest subset of vertices where there is no edge between any pair so mm. for example you know i spent 10 minutes and i thought okay this probably is four is the highest you can do here um mm -hmm. but i don't know maybe you can imran you, you know maybe you can find five vertices here which form an independent set uh i i think uh, four is an uh, optimal solution but uh, what is the role of epsilon in this particular case that is what i try to understand ah right sorry yes 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 so so now so so here is four so it's very small but imagine that the independent set has some value and what you want is you want to compute another independent set, but you know we can't find the maximum. So, for example, in a planar graph, let's say to find four might be very hard. Although four is easy, but you know in general, an independent set might be hard. And so, what you do is epsilon is the parameter that dictates the quality. So, uh, it's it basically you know you have to satisfy a, a user, and the user says, look, it's very important for me to have a solution which is not too bad, and not too bad is parameterized by epsilon. So. Epsilon tells you how close, so you want to compute a solution which is epsilon close to the optimal okay. answer. Uh, so, as, and that's why the running time here increases as epsilon goes down. So as epsilon goes down, I becomes closer to opt, right? I mean, opt is the best you can do. So I will always be less than equal to opt. Uh, and as epsilon goes down, uh, your solution becomes better and better. You know, uh, of course, at zero, you get the optimal solution, but zero we can't do. So that's why epsilon is bigger than zero. And what you want somehow is a flexibility in deciding if it's very important for you to have a good solution, then you can have a budget on the time and you can say, fine, I mean, I want epsilon, I'm going to give epsilon to be very, very small, but then my running time uh, will be good. For example, even here, like if I give epsilon to be one over n, my running time becomes two to the n, so it becomes exponential. So you leave it to the user. So what you want, so you compute not one algorithm, you compute a family of algorithms where for each epsilon, there's an algorithm. And the user tells you what's the quality that they want. And then based on that, you, you compute an answer with that quality, but with the caveat that the running time would grow pretty fast if the quality becomes very small mm -hmm. or very high. Meaning if you get very close to the optimal, the running time becomes very high. So for example, I, I, epsilon here, sorry. Uh, so, uh, so what's the way of uh, getting the... Uh, without knowing the exact answer, how people... Uh, exactly. So that's the topic of this talk, yes. Yeah. Okay, 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 yeah. okay. That's the whole point. You don't know opt. So yeah. any i that you return, how do you know that it's within epsilon to the optimum answer? You don't know that. Uh, yeah. And that's what you, you would think. But actually, uh, there are ways, and that's exactly what I will do next. Perfect. Any other questions? If that uh, uh, you would like to ask something, uh, you were dropping. yeah. So no, so actually, Nabil is going to talk about it anyway. That was my question. So okay, generally, okay. we have a, a, a bound on opt, right? Uh, yeah, some yeah, kind yeah. of a lower, uh, uh, an upper bound on opt, and we'll use that. And uh, I think these are called PTAS, right? Uh, polynomial time approximation schemes. Uh, exactly, in that yes, yes, yes. Well, so that's the question. So uh, you will see exactly what. What do we need for this whole thing to work? That's the question. Uh, do you need op to be small? Do you need op to be large? Uh, you know, what's going on here? That's what I'm going to talk about. Yeah. Can we continue? Okay. All right. So, uh, excellent. Okay. So, now the idea of Lipton and Tarjan is turned out to be really one of the, sort of the great fundamental ideas um, in this area. Uh, well, separator. So the idea is the following, what they showed, and various versions of the statement were known before, but what they showed is the following, that if you give me a planar graph, uh, then I can find, then there exists a, a set of vertices. So I've written it visually as a curve, but the thing important about the curve are the, the by the way, can you see my pointer? Yes, we can see. Ah. Yes, okay, so I can see it. Okay, so, the, so it's, I've written it, sort of, I've drawn it geometrically, but uh, 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 the these are the vertices, so that's what's called, you know that's a separator. So it's a subset of vertices. Here I've drawn it as a curve because we're talking about planar graphs and it's kind of visual. Um, so what they showed 
uh, was that there's a, a, a curve uh, which contains very few vertices, or there's a subset of vertices, very few. And when, when, when I say very few, I mean square root of n, and you will see why I say that it's not too big, such that it kind of divides the graph equally into two pieces. So in other words, that if you were to remove these vertices, you would have two disconnected pieces of graphs, one inside and one in, uh, outside, and both contain, so this is this awkward number here, but basically, you know, you should not read that. It's basically n. So meaning that, think of it that there's a curve or there's a set of a small set of vertices which partitions the graph into two pieces, each of size at most n over two. Okay, it's slightly, it's between n over three and two n over three, uh, but roughly equal. Okay, uh, and that's, uh, you know, beyond this application, this theorem turned out to be a very powerful tool uh, because as you can see, it's divide and conquer. You can, you can uh, uh, pick a set of vertices, remove them, divide the graph into two pieces and then continue. And so their algorithm was very simple. Once you know that there is such a separator and you can compute it, uh, you compute it, you throw away the vertices and you recurse separately. You compute the independence at here. So you compute a set of vertices which are not connected by an edge here. You compute an independence at outside and you return the union as the answer. And uh, of course it's, a, it's an independent set because you, since we cut out these, we will throw them out. This vertices of C, we will not include in our solution. Those are gone which means that any edge, I mean, you, you cannot have an edge between a vertex inside and a vertex outside. Uh, they have to go through a vertex here, which we cut out. So, which means that somehow you re, your problem size goes from n to, uh, you know, 2n over 3 or n over 2. Think of it as just n over 2. So you half your problem size and you throw away square root of n vertices. Okay. And the question is, this solution, uh, this algorithm, so... So I, one thing I didn't specify here, yeah, I should have, is that you continue until some certain time. So continue as long as each uh, problem has large size, uh, then you can keep on doing separator, separator, separator. And at some point you stop and you return uh, your current solution there and that's your answer. And so the question is, why should this give you a good answer? Uh, uh, so Naveen, can I ask yeah. a question? So this interior graph and exterior graph, what is the relation between them? This, uh, they are disconnected from each other? So, it's a thing, I mean, the picture uh, shows that we have a planar graph and imagine that you can find a cycle. So it's a planar graph. So edges, if, if you have a cycle in this graph, an edge can't cut across. So because of that, this curve C somehow breaks the graph into the inside part and the outside part. And okay. Uh, so and the there, there, side, there are no edges between a vertex in interior uh, part and a vertex in the exterior part. That's absolutely. I mean, well, yeah, the, 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 exactly. The only interfaces are vertices on the boundary. Okay. And here and, we are using the fact the, that it's a planar graph. Yeah. Okay. So we uh, so now it's critically using the planarity, but the interior and exterior graph internally are connected, or they could be even many. We don't care. We don't care. Yeah, we don't care. Okay. I mean, the, the only thing you care is that interior is again a planar graph and the outside is again a planar graph. So it's, it's, it's more about numbers and those kind of things as opposed to the structural uh, properties of planar graphs. I mean, once you have the separator, you can, it's just chop and, uh, you know, and solve, you know, you just divide and conquer. Um, you don't care if it's disconnected and so on. So you find a small set of vertices which partition the graph into two pieces, each of roughly linear size and then you recur separately to compute an independent set. And there's no edge between these two parts. And, yes. and that's all you need. Okay. So, okay. So now the, the question is, of course, it's the algorithm. Once you have this separator, this uh, subset of a small set of vertices C that you throw away, um, you ask the question that my solution, if I don't know the optimal, how good is it? Okay. And the problem is that it, yes, there's a question. Yes, sir. I want to ask the question that if the exterior part, uh, please let us clear that the exterior part would be connected or disconnected or it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Oh, it may be connected or maybe disconnected. Okay. Right, thanks. Right, right. Okay. So now, now when you're uh, trying to analyze this, um, this algorithm, um, uh, you know, you want it. So what we have, done, I mean, the, the bad part here is that at each step of my recursion, I'm throwing away these vertices. 
And that's dangerous because, you know, we don't know the optimal. As Imran said, we have no idea what the optimal is. Uh, we can't compute it. And so if I throw away all these versions of C without even asking, could they be useful? Am I throwing away too much? Am I somehow uh, endangering myself that at the end, I have an independent set of very small size? You know, uh, could it be that, you know, this throwing this was a mistake? And once you throw away, you you can't get a good solution. Okay, so that's really the the worry here. And the answer, uh, which uh, uh, was provided by Lipton and Tarjan, is that no. Uh, the key idea is the following: that planar graphs are sparse, and by that I mean so you have when you have n vertices, you could have n squared edges in the graph. Uh, but in fact, we know that planar graphs only have a linear number of edges. These constants are not so important here. You know, it could be. And a six is not important at all. Uh, three could be a, a million, we don't care. The important thing is it's a constant. So there's a linear number of edges in the planar graph, which means that, and that goes to Imdad's point earlier, that since the number of edges are linear, uh, there exists an independent set of size at least n over five, right? Because what's the average degree here, right? So the average degree is less than six. Because uh, you know these are the number of edges, so degrees are twice that, so it's six n minus twelve. So minus twelve means it's not six; it's slightly less than six. So it's you know uh, the average degree is less than six. Let me put it this way. And so you can you know take a vertex of degree five and then remove their five, its five neighbors and repeat and so on. So um, what we do know is that independent uh, planar graphs have because they have few edges, they have a large independent set. And now the thing is, and that's the key thing, is that the, the stuff that we're losing at each step, I mean, we just threw this guy away, the square root of n vertices. Uh, the, the point is that square root of n is not too big compared to n. So this independent set has size n over five, and we are throwing away square root of n. So it's actually very small. I mean, it's a negligible part of, so even if we don't know the optimal answer, uh, and but the only thing we, but we do know that the optimal answer is large. And so what we throw away is very small compared to what's uh, possible. And so what you can then show is that when you do the, uh, do the uh, calculation, you, in the end, if you don't go down too deep, you don't throw away too many vertices. You throw away, you know, only epsilon n vertices. And since the independence has a size n over five, you get epitas. So in other words, uh, you go until, you know, each subset has size like, you know, uh, one or epsilon or one or epsilon squared, and you compute the optimal answer there and you return all of these subsets. And at each step, you don't lose too much uh, because the real answer is very big. So compared to that, the, the, what you lose is very small. And once you do the calculation, you end up with a PTAS. You can show that, uh, and, uh, and the running time is something like uh, two to the one over epsilon squared times n or something. So that that was basically the algorithm of Lipton and Tarjan. Uh, it uses critic. It uses two facts. One that that a small set of vertices partitions the graph into two equal pieces. That's the first property. And the second property is that in a planar graph, and for that you need planarity. And the second way that planarity is used is that the maximum independent set in a planar graph is large, right? Because I mean, it, it's kind of obvious from the picture even, right? That if, well, right? I mean, if edges can't intersect, it's kind of, the graph is kind of spread out. And if it's spread out, you know, uh, like the, a vertex on this corner and a vertex on that corner, they're not gonna have an edge between them. So even visually, you can see that there's some sort of spreading out phenomenon happening in planar graphs. And because of that, uh, you have this property, these two properties, you have the separator, and you have a large independent set. And together, they imply that you can do that. Okay, so that's what they their sort of result was. Yeah, any questions? Uh, 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 now I got get your point and definitely the idea is quite brilliant. Uh, so the main idea is, uh, the main issue is uh, whether this kind of curve always exists or not. So for planar graphs, they always exist. That's what they showed. Oh, okay. 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 And uh, I think uh, for trees, uh, this is a simpler case. 
Absolutely, absolutely. So for trees, in fact, uh, you can find uh, one vertex, uh, which disconnects into two pieces, two trees of roughly equal size. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Exactly, okay. that's exactly correct, yes. So th they worked with planar graphs. They first showed that planar graphs have this property, that there's a curve which cuts very few things and which partition the graph equally. And that's the hard part, actually. After that, this is pretty, uh, pretty natural. So uh, the hard part was showing this and then divide and conquer on that. Okay, okay. Uh, any other questions? No, so you earlier mentioned, Naveel, that this curve, uh, like you drew it is a cycle. And uh, so is it required to be like a cycle? Or it's a great question. Graph? Well, you, then, you know, like anything important, there are a million variations on this. So yeah. um, okay. if you assume that the graph is triangulated, then, then there is a, a cycle. But, you know, a planar graph could be a path. Uh, or it could be a tree. A tree is a planar graph. So there you can't get a cycle. So there, the most abstract version says that there's a subset of size square root of n, and that subset we call the separator, as such that once you remove the subset, the remaining pieces of the graph can be put into two, two camps, where in each camp you have about a linear number of vertices. So that's the, the most general sort of structure-less uh, question. And once, uh, but for certain cases, if you know more things about the planar graph that it's, you know, triangulated and so on, then you can show that, in fact, this set of square root of n vertices, you can think of it visually as a cycle and so on. So, like, so that's, so the basic thing is, it makes sense that if uh, generally it should only think we could be able to prove is having a subset of vertices removing which will do this, uh, disconnect the graphs into two components. Because so if I, the the whole graph the the global graph is a tree, I wouldn't be able to find a a, a, a cycle that separates it. Right? The, exactly. The, then you will have to yeah. But in in everything that it I would be an easier problem I know but right right in that exactly. I mean in all of this you don't need a cycle. I mean cycle you draw because visually you know that's how you think about these things. But it's basically just a set of vertices you remove to do divide and conquer. Okay. And Nabil, uh, did they give some algorithm in order to construct this C? Excellent question, Imran. Uh, so since this is not my uh, 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 sort of, I'm not going to talk too much about this algorithm. Exactly. So the question of how to compute C is uh, turned out to be a fundamental question. And there was a series of work in the 70s, 80s. And I uh, and right now, in fact, uh, given a planar graph in a suitable format, uh, you, you can have a linear time algorithm to compute C. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, but it's a non-trivial question. It, in fact, out of the construction of how, uh, why such a C exists, uh, an algorithm comes which is not efficient, and then a lot of effort was made uh, to, to make it uh, fast, and it, they do exist, yes. Yeah, well, probably I, I, uh, I'm just speculating, particularly I was just thinking about a, a similar kind of algorithm where uh, the best choice of these kind of vertices to appear on, at C should be the one with the with the highest number of degree i think yes. you know i'm just speculating yeah yeah <laughs> you could try these kind of things exactly um but you know but uh, but 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 imran you know in a planar graph there are only three and edges so the average degree is just a constant so mm. it may be so maybe the proof one way to do the proof would be that if there's one degree of really high, one vertex of high degree that's a good good candidate to remove uh, because yeah. in, in, put it in c uh, but otherwise, actually, uh, very quickly, if you keep doing that, you will realize that uh, since the average degree is a constant, uh, you will only have a constant number of uh, uh, such things uh, or a few rounds, maybe login or something. And um, uh, most of the degrees, most of the vertices will have just a constant degree. So the right way to think about this is not in terms of high degree vertices, but more in terms of that a planar graph. You know, when I think of a planar graph, the first graph I think of in my mind is a grid. So mm -hmm. if you take a square root of n by square root of n grid, uh, that's a planar graph. And the separator basically says that if you take, if you cut this grid in the middle, so, you know, it, the grid has n vertices. So each side length is square root of n. So square root of n by square root of n. And that's where the square root of n comes from. So the classical example of a planar graph where when you want to think about these things is a grid. And then when you cut the grid in the middle, you are cutting along, let's say, the x-axis. 
uh, then you cut square root of n uh, vertices to get these two parts. Uh, is there any uh, lower bound known on the C? Uh, uh, yeah, sure. So that, that's another thing that has been studied. So so in, in my talk now, I, I, I won't be looking too much at constants. Uh, it's everything, as long as you know uh, it, it works, you don't care about the constant. But for the combinatorial structure, I think right now, uh, so I don't know. The, the, uh, I think the best constant uh, here, uh, if you want a third and so on, the best constant is six point something. So that has been studied in a sequence of papers to find what's, I mean, what's the hidden in this O notation. And I think it's not, I mean, they're close, but uh, the precise constant is not known. Okay. No, but, sir, but is, is there any hope that it could be log n? Uh, no, 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 no. Square root of n, we know. I mean, the, the grid, for example. Okay. If okay. you take so a grid, right. if, if you take yeah. a square root of n by square root of n grid, uh, you, you know, you yeah. have to cut across something yeah. and you need to cut square root of n things. The qu question is what's constant next to square root of n? Okay, okay. Yeah. But of course, you know, it could be that in certain graphs, like if you take a star graph, yeah, it's in a graph, mm -hmm. uh, but there the separator has size one because it's a tree. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, different planar graphs have different sizes, but in the worst case, you cannot improve on the square root of n asymptotic uh, bound, except on the constant, and you can try to find out what's the best constant here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Imdad, you had a question? No, get it. that was me. I just asked. Thank you. Ah, okay, okay. All right. So, Okay, so so the, the idea is again that you, you have this uh, separator of small size and that allows you to divide and conquer. That's one idea. Second is that the independent sets in planar graphs are large. Okay, so um, now the problem is, so this is very nice. Uh, the problem is when you try to look at more general scenarios. So a, a natural scenario is I give you now, I don't give you a planar graph. I give you a bunch of disks in the plane. And among these disks, I you can... Get a, these disks basically capture a graph, which is the intersection graph. So for each disk, um, you put a vertex and uh, you put an edge between two disks if they intersect. So it's a graph. Okay. Uh, and the question is now, what about this? If we know that general graphs are hard, we know planar graphs are relatively easy. What about this case? Um, it's, you know, what can you do there? Now, this is a natural next question to look at, because if you look at, there's a beautiful result, which says the following. If you give me any planar graph, what I can do is that for each vertex of that planar graph, uh, I can put a, I can make a disk so that the disks are interior disjoint. So they only intersect in the boundary and their intersection graph is precisely the planar graph. So in fact, planar graphs, each of them can be represented as the intersection of interior disjoint disks. So this class of graphs contains planar graphs, all of them. And this is this was shown many times uh, and if, you know, called the Cobb uh, and Reeve Thurston theorem. And so, you know, uh, the next question one would I, I look at is what about if I give you a bunch of disks? They don't, I have, I've drawn them as unit disks. They don't have to be unit disks. They can be of arbitrary size. Um, and I want an independent set in their intersection graph, which visually means a subset of disks which don't overlap, which don't intersect, okay? Even on the boundary. So their interior disjoint uh, and also disjoint on the boundary, okay? And just for example, K4, for example, if you're looking for the complete graph on four vertices, you have this K4 here, uh, you see, um, you know, the four vertices of the graph and each pairwise sort of touches, right? Okay. And so the question is, the previous machinery, does it work in this case? Now, the problem here, unfortunately, is two things. First, I mean, the intersection graph is not planar. So this intersection graph, uh, well, I haven't calculated, but probably it's not planar because you can see a K5 here or a K33 here or something. So, I mean, you can have the complete graph as, you know, if you put N disks all, you know, stacked on top of each other, their intersection graph is Kn uh, for which, you know, uh, uh, kind of, uh, it's not planar, very, it's, you know, it's a complete graph. So that's one problem. And second is that in this uh, graph, the answer and the second property, so the separators are not there, that's one thing. Second is that in this, the, the answer could be very small. So for example, here, uh, the optimal answer is just three, ver three vertices or three disks. 
right? Because uh, unless I may, I've uh, made a mistake, you can't find in this configuration of disks, you can't find four disks which are pairwise disjoint. Um, probably I would take this, maybe this, but then, yeah. Yeah, I, so I think here, uh, the best you can do is three. And that's bad because that means that if mistakenly you throw out one of the disks, then you've lost one third of your solution. You know, so this is very delicate. If the, if the independent set is small, you don't have much freedom to throw around things, right? I mean, then you really have to find a needle in a haystack. Okay, so the question is the previous algorithm, the classical uh, things don't work here. And the question is what can be done? here? Okay, and you can ask this more generally. So you can ask it, what about intersection graph of uh, segments in the plane or, you know, hitting set where you have points and such sets are induced by disks or, you know, dominating set on the intersection graph and so on. Okay, so those kind of questions, all this previous machine you have divided and conquer with uh, these separators doesn't work. Uh, and so the question is uh, what to do here. And for that, I'll now turn to sort of, you know, divide and conquer is like a zeroth level uh, algorithm, a very sort of um, um, uh, greedy in a sense that once you make a decision, you stick with it. Once you de de decide to throw away the vertices of the separator and recurse, you do that. You have no regrets about the past. Um, but the next level where you're worrying more about what, whether you made mistakes in the past is local search. And I turned, so that's the second part of my talk where I'll talk about that. And then the third part is uh, relating it to expansion in, in planar graphs. Okay. Um, so the local search algorithm is, is pretty, pretty uh, kind of generic. So, you know, you start with any solution and you just try to improve it by locally uh, modifying certain things. So you take some small stuff that you can, you know, replace or modify and you do that, right? So that's the generic local search algorithm. And if you were to look at it for our problem, it would be this. So K is a parameter for the moment. Uh, imagine it's just some number, three, four, five, ten, 10, whatever. And this is the new algorithm. Okay, so you do the, I mean, this is, you know, if you give the, you know, this question, independence question to students, that's probably the algorithm they will come up with that start with any solution. And then if you can, let's say, drop K minus one vertices in your current solution and increase and replace them with K so that your independent set side grows, you do that. And you keep doing it until you cannot. Uh, so the algorithm is, uh, and the question of course is, if you were to run this algorithm on planar graphs, what would you get? Could it get stuck somewhere? Could it be that your initial choice was so bad that you cannot get out of it? Okay, so for the rest, uh, for this uh, part, let's say I is the output of this algorithm. And the end, you keep trying to improve. And when you are unable to improve by, uh, by modifying some K subset, uh, K size subset, then you give up and you say, okay, that's my answer. And O is opt. So I just change it to a shorter notation. So opt is the fix one optimal answer. Okay. So this is what our algorithm comes up with. This is the optimal answer. We don't know O. As Imran said, we have no idea what O is. So O, this is all uh, just analysis. It's just all in our head. So we don't know what O is, but uh, we imagine that this is I and this is you know O. And we want to compare. We want to say that I is not too much smaller than O. That's our goal. So that's what I mean by how good the algorithm is. Okay, and so can it fail badly? So the, the first thing to notice here is the fact, so uh, the question here is the fact that you cannot drop, you cannot improve your independent set by dropping K minus one vertices and adding K. What does that mean? What property does that give you? What's the consequence of this maintaining this kind of invariant here? And here's the idea. So take your current solution, which is I, and take the optimal O. We don't know O, but you know, imagine that you have it. Uh, and look at just the graph, the, inter uh, the, the planar graph uh, induced on I and O. Okay, so you, have, you were given a planar graph G. 
I'm not talking about disks anymore. I've gotten back to the problem on planar graphs uh, for the moment. So uh, you have I, which is your solution, O, which is the optimal solution, and look at the graph uh, induced by them. Okay, so what do we know? Here's uh, what I'm claiming. Take any set of K vertices, let's say O prime of the optimal solution. Okay, so, and let's say that in this graph G prime, I prime are the solution, are the vertices that we picked in our solution that were connected to O prime. Okay, so you have uh, O prime here. Uh, and all the things in I that they intersect are these. And so the question is, the key idea or the, 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 the key insight is can this set, can it be of smaller size than O prime? So O is the optimal answer. So O is a maximum independent set of the largest size. I is where we stop when we could not drop K minus one vertices and improve it by adding K other vertices. Oh, so if it is smaller, I will throw out this I prime and add O prime, right? Exactly. So if precisely in that, if uh, this was smaller than what we could have done was when we were at I, we could have dropped because uh, these vertices, so if this has size K and this is smaller, this has size less than K minus one. So what we could have done is in our I, we could have dropped these vertices and replaced them by these. And my claim is that it's still independent because these guys, in I, the only thing they intersect are these guys and we are dropping them and we are replacing it with O prime. And since O prime is independent, there's no edge between them. So then why didn't the algorithm improve it? So this cannot happen. So this cannot happen exactly as Imdad said, that if you take your current solution, you drop I prime. Uh, if such a scenario were to happen, and you add O prime, and this is still independent. Uh, and we know that I prime is less than K minus one because this is at most K. So this must be, it is, we are assuming it is smaller. And then we could have just uh, replaced this with that to improve our size. So this cannot happen. So we know that whatever O is, we don't know, but we do know that this property must be true. That for any subset of O, when I look at their neighbors in I, they cannot be smaller. Okay, so this is expansion. Uh, so here's the property. So I know that when I stop, I have a solution I, uh, and there's an optimal solution O, then this must be true. Okay. And, uh, you know, uh, typically in the literature, you call this expansion. So all subsets of size at most K are expanding in G prime, meaning that when you look at their neighbors, the neighbors are appear to be are larger in their size, or at least that much. Okay. So what this section has shown is that if you do local search uh, and you cannot improve anymore, you do get a property on the graph between your current solution and the optimal solution. And the property is exactly this, that the optimal solution is expanding in in the graph uh, G prime. So, Nabil, uh, will we use this G prime, the induced subgraph? Isn't this true for the whole graph? Well, we're talking about O and I only. Yeah, but so, the so other vertices don't, I mean, a vertex which is not an O and what, not an I. Yeah, you have properties there as well, but we don't care about them. Our goal, remember, is only to relate the size of I to the size of O. Everything else is irrelevant. Yeah, okay. You're right. You're right. I mean, this was more generally. We know that for every subset of I of size at most K minus one, and for every subset of G of size K, this property is true. Uh, yeah. But, you know, what we are concerned about is to find the O optimal. And so we, we focus our attention on the interaction between I and O. Okay. Yeah. Exactly, you're right. You're right. That this holds more generally, but you know, uh, we don't care about sort of you know random vertices. We we are we are worried about our own. Okay, all right. So that just shows that local search is very uh, much related to this property of expansion. So let me just restate it again. So now 
Forget about the algorithm. Now it's we've turned it to a combinatorial question. So I give you a planar graph between a, a set of red vertices O. Uh, in, in the back of our mind, O is corresponds to the optimal answer. Um, I is our solution from the K local search. And they have this property that no matter what, sub, if all subsets of size at most K and O, uh, when you look at their neighbors, uh, it's a bipartite graph. Okay, so it's a bipartite graph between O and I. And I tell you that for you know, all subsets of size at most K, they are, expand they are expanding in G prime. And the question then is, so this is, you know, uh, in I prime, this is a subset of I. Uh, and the question is, so intuitively, so imagine, I mean, that this, imagine, I mean, you know, this, this huge graph is drawn in the plane. It's a massive graph with billions of vertices. And all you know is that from the point of view of each subset of size at most k, when you look at it, and it's a bipartite graph, it's between red and blue vertices. It's a planar graph between red and blue vertices. And what you know is that from the point of view of all subsets of size at most k, all the red subsets of size, of, it looks like when they look at their neighbors, the neighbors seem more. That's what this condition is saying, that if you look at a subset of size k and you look at their neighbors, their neighbors are more than them. So, and then the question is, if that is the case locally, is this also true globally? Meaning, is it true then that the total size of I should be at least that of O, or at least should not be much smaller than O? I mean, can it be that locally, it looks like things are bigger, the, the, the blues are bigger, but in reality, in, when you zoom out and we look at the global picture, it would turn out that no, blues are very small. Can that happen? So that's the question. Um, now, let's... In that case, okay. Oh, so, I, you, you, you want us to answer the question or try to No, no, no. R rhetorical question. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, but, but, okay, but, uh, well, in that, now that you have uh, said something, well, why don't you, uh, uh, can you please say what you were saying? So, I, I think it will kind of uh, um, imply that there is a small O prime or, uh, so, so many many vertices in O are adjacent to the same set of I prime Precisely. vertices. Yeah, yeah. And that will kind of uh, contradict not planarity, right? So there will be a K3, exactly. 3 or something like that. Right, right. Exactly, exactly. So when you start looking at examples, so look at the, the case K equal to 1. So what does that mean? So, you know, for each K, I, in my mind, I have to uh, say that thing in, in English. So K is equal to 1 means that for every vertex in O, they have at least one neighbor in I. Um, can that then in that case, can the sizes of, uh, can I be very small? If every red vertex sees a blue vertex, can the number of blue vertices be very small? Unfortunately, yes, right? So here you see each red vertex sees a blue vertex, but it's the same blue vertex. So globally, when you zoom out, there are very few, there's just one blue vertex, but from the point of view of every red vertex, it looks like there's many, there's, you know, one blue vertex, but they're all to the same blue. So that doesn't work. So I can be much smaller here. Now, you could look at k equal to 2. The same problem happens. So from the point of view of every two red vertices, it seems like there are at least two blue vertices. But unfortunately, they all point to the same blue vertices. So uh, again, locally, it looks like there would be a lot of blue vertices because every pair of red vertices sees two blue vertices. But uh, unfortunately, globally, uh, there are very few blue vertices. And now you can repeat it. So for k equal to 3, you again have very few blue vertices. You have only three blue vertices, and you can have a billion uh, red vertices. And you have the same problem, that from the point of view of every three vertices, it looks like there's uh, you know, at least those many blue vertices. But actually, it's just the same blue repeating again and again and again. Yes, Imran. I think the quest will stop at four. But no, no. Uh, try again. <laughs> uh, because of the four color problem. I will yeah, that's no, a good point. Saw contradiction, K33, three, three, no? Exactly. So I'm saying, why yeah. four, not three? This example. Uh, there's a problem with this example, Imran. You believe me too easily. You're too trusting. So there's a yeah. problem with this example. Okay. What's the problem? It's not a planar graph. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So in fact, it stops at three. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So now the question is, so then it leads to the question that for k equal to three, 
um, you can try, can you come up with an example? So what's the worst case you can construct for k equal to three? And by that, I mean, I want to minimize my number of blue vertices and maximize my number of red vertices, but maintaining the property that all subsets of size at most, all red subsets of size at most three see at least those many blue vertices and, and the graph is planar. Under those constraints, how unequal can I make O, uh, can I make the red and the blue vertices? That's the question. And at this point, you know, you start, you, you, you take out your piece of paper and you try drawing examples, how to maximize uh, the number of red while maintaining planarity and maintaining that uh, this expansion property. Now, you know, I tried for a while and then, you know, you can, uh, my colleagues and, you know, uh, this doesn't work. So this is not planar, unfortunately. Uh, and, and so, in fact, what you can show uh, is this theorem that, in fact, I cannot be too small. I will be at least one eighth of the size of O. Okay. And you can ask, well, is this right? Is that, can you improve it further? And in, in fact, the answer is no. And here's an example. So it's a great, so imagine I've just drawn like four, but imagine that this cell can be replicated. So imagine a grid-like structure. Okay. So uh, you have a grid-like structure and in each cell here, you have eight vertices. You have four vertices here and four red. So globally, the red are around eight times as much as the blue. Okay. And um uh, are at most eight times as much as the, the, the blue. And the claim is that, well, it's planar. That's easy to see. And the claim is that this has expansion. Meaning that every subset here of size at most three, when you look at their neighbors, it will be at least that much size. But well, each vertex has degree at least two. So, you know, of course, every subset of two will have at least two neighbors. My, but the, the thing to verify here is that every subset of three vertices will have at least three uh, blue neighbors. For example, here you could say, well, I can pick, pick these two red vertices. They only have these two. But now to any third vertex you add, will add a new blue vertex uh, and so on. So this proves that this, this theorem is tight. And in fact, this is the... So if you were to run local search uh, with k equal to three for planar graphs, you cannot do worse than factor eight away from the optimal. And this is an example which shows that you you can just do that. I mean, you can be stuck there. So here, if I were to start with the blue vertices at the beginning and the optimal is the red, I will not be able to make any progress. Um, and so, this, you know, so it shows that somehow for planarity, expansion is useful once K becomes three and uh, it, it behaves exactly like this. And we understand it perfectly, this behavior. You can ask the same question for, ah, um, Imran, I had to stop at 12.50, am I right? Uh, at uh, 4.50. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, you can conclude, you can conclude, uh, Nabil. How much time do I have? Uh, maybe uh, next five minutes, you can you can stop. Okay, we can we can proceed it. Extend uh, the time a bit. Okay, okay, okay. Can, can I have 10 minutes or is that too much to ask for? Uh, no, no, it's okay. You can take. You can okay. it. I'll try five, but I'm warning <laughs> okay. you. Okay. Okay. okay, okay. All right. So you have this. And then if you try the, the four expansion, uh, uh, you can ask, what about k equal to four? Meaning all subtle size at most four expand. And in fact, you can do better. Uh, and uh, you can do better. You can do four. And that's tight. You have an example. And in general, in fact, the theorem says that, so this is the, 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 the theorem on expansion which says that if you have a k-expanding planar graph for k at least three, it kind of behaves, like the, it, it kind of converges to the optimal in this manner. So as k increases, it gets closer and closer to, uh, to the optimal. Okay, so I was going to give you a proof of that, uh, but let me skip that. Uh, um, uh, and I'll send the slides uh, so that you can uh, look at it later. Okay, so... Uh, so what this says, this theorem says that if you do local search with parameter k, then i is not going to be too much smaller than o. And if I want to get close, if I want this to be epsilon, 
right? Because our goal was to that the user gives me an epsilon. Then what I can do is I can pick my local search parameter to be something so that this is uh, one over, um, so that this is epsilon. And so I totally, in total, I get um, uh, epsilon here, and then K would be one over epsilon squared. Okay, so I, I let you just look at it for a minute. Uh, I just come back in one second. Ah, oh, sorry, sorry for the interruption. Okay, so that shows that um, you get with an epsilon, but when you do local search, you do it over one or epsilon squared steps. Any questions? No, no, please continue, please continue. Okay. All right, so this also proves something called a local version of false theorem, which is that you're given a, a bipartite graph, but it's expanding only up to uh, sort of sets of size k. And so you get this new theorem. <clears throat> all right. Now, the key thing is that in all that we did now for planar graphs, we did not need the fact that the optimal was large. So that's the key point, which means now that we can go back and <laughs> solve the problem for disks. So here's the algorithm for disks. The same local search algorithm. You replace k minus one with k. By the previous result, we know that the intersection graph is k expanding. And now, even though the intersection graph of disks is not planar, the bipartite intersection graph between our solution and the optimal is planar. And therefore, <clears throat> you get that local search gives you a betas. So this is the, the key point that divide and conquer is fast, but it requires that whatever you throw away is not um, is inconsequential compared to the optimal. 
Local search is much more methodical. You can drop vertices, then pick them back, back up again and so on. And now, uh, not only does it also work for planar graphs, but even for disks, it gives you a beta. So that's really the, the key point of this talk that uh, uh, local search is a more powerful paradigm, slower, but more powerful. So here's an example where for disks, uh, you can, for example, if you do three local search for disks, then you cannot do better than a factor of eight. So the blue are the, the current solution that you start with I, and the red is O, and O is eight times that of I, but you cannot improve um, I, meaning that you cannot take any two blue disks and replace them with three red disks. That's not possible. Uh, so this so this sort of tiling, not tiling, but this sort of packing or configuration of disks shows that uh, whatever we said earlier is tight uh, in the worst case. I mean, if you do three local search for disks, you cannot do better than a factor eight approximation. And this is the example which shows that you start with the blue and you get stuck with the blue. It also works for all other sort of hitting set variants and so on. So there's been a lot of work. Um, in the last 10, 15 years on uh, solving various questions with it. Uh, uh, the, the, the main negative point about local search is that it's slow. Uh, the running time is n to the k. And if you want epsilon here, it's n to the one over epsilon squared. So, and that's where we are currently stuck. So the state of the art really is for these combinatorial problems. Uh, can we avoid putting epsilon or k in the exponent of n. I mean, is something like two to the two to the two to the k possible in times n possible instead of this form? Um, so that's the main open question. Uh, in general, this theorem cannot be improved. So you, you can construct examples of i and o where o is expanding and yet i uh, is kind of, uh, it's roughly the size. So it's, you can't hope to improve this more. You can't make this k, for example. Square root is necessary. Um, okay. So to summarize, I mean, you have a local search. It's um, a different paradigm. And it's very nice because it links. The algorithm doesn't need to know O, the optimal. But in the analysis, you, you look at O. Um, the negative parts are that, that it's quite slow. And to be able to sort of theoretically guarantee a fast algorithm, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a major open question. We don't know. Uh, all right, so that was the talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nabil. Thank you very much for uh, introducing such a wonderful problem. I believe uh, lots, of, uh, lots of participants get lots of interesting uh, insight of this particular problem. So, so Iman, there... sorry, Iman, sorry, let me just interrupt you because uh, when you talk about interesting, uh, of course, that's a, that's a, such an interesting word, interesting. Uh, so let me just uh, finish with one question here. So what we know is this, that uh, if you have four expanding graphs, then I has to be at least, so you can see it's decreasing as with three, you get eight, with four, you get four, and with in general with K, you get this. So as K increases, you get better and better. Uh, we don't know what the best answer is for five. So if I give you a planar graph, which is five expanding, uh, what, I mean, we know that it's going to be less than four, but what mm -hmm. is it that number we still don't know? Mm -hmm. So that's the open mm -hmm. question for the talk. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Very interesting. Anyways, uh, uh, Nabil, uh, please do share the slides with us. We will put it up. Uh, and uh, are there any questions uh, from the audience? Yeah. yeah. 